Well, if we haven't had a chance to meet one another, my name is Van. Again, welcome to those of you who might be guests here today. And one of the things you'll find out about me if we're around each other for very long is that um, I actually love the business world. I was a, a business major as, as an undergraduate at a at university and have always maintained kind of a love for the business world. And then like, you know, the typical kiddo, right? Go off, spend all the money on education and then do something totally different than what I studied. Ended up going to seminary and getting a theology degree and now I am here as a pastor. But business has always been a big piece of how I live and kind of finance world and the stock market has always kind of been a back of my mind type hobby. And when we first got married, you know, this was all just still kind of a part of who I was. And we had a little bit of money that we had gotten as a part of some gifts for our wedding. And I said to my wife, I was like, babe, look, so in my, all my business classes, all we're talking about, this is late nineties, all we're talking about is China and how China's going to boom. And I was like, we got to invest in the internet in China. I mean, this is just a few years after the internet had gotten big here. And I knew this thing was going to take off. And I was like, let's just put all the money we got, Chinese internet stock, we'll be millionaires. And then, you know, sounder minds prevail. And I was like, no, that's dumb. Don't ever do that. You never put all your money into one stock. You invest in a portfolio of stocks and you get an index fund. And I did all the conservative route. And then two years later, I went back and looked at that Chinese internet stock that I wanted to invest in. And sure enough, we would have been multimillionaires had we done it, but we never did do it. So here we were stuck. And I was like, man, I can't believe it. I knew it was right. I knew it was going to be valuable, but I didn't do it. And then earlier this year, I had that same intuition come up, and I was like, hold on, they're legalizing pot everywhere. If I, <laughs> if I invest in some marijuana stock, we're going to, this would be good. You know, and the Lord looked at me, he's like, man, serious? I'm like, Lord, I don't want to smoke it. I just was going to invest in it. <laughs> but I didn't do that either. But along the way in life, I've come across some, some moments where I realized, hey, there is a a value decision to be made here. And sometimes I've looked back over my shoulder and thought, ooh, I'm glad I did not do that. But sometimes I've looked back over my shoulder and said, wow, I missed an opportunity. And sometimes I looked over my shoulder and said, I'm so thankful that I took that particular opportunity. Are you aware of the moments and the decisions and the relationships in your life that carry priceless value? Moments in time, moments in your story or little... Uh, uh, intersections in life where you could go to the right or to the left and you either chose wisely or you chose out of ignorance or you chose uh, to go rebellion and to actually go away. You knew you shouldn't go and you look back over your shoulder and go, wow, that was a major moment. There was major value in that decision. I, I remember some of the commercials that used to be on TV for MasterCard. You remember the, the commercials, they, were, they would end with the phrase priceless. And so it was like the father and dad going to a baseball game and they say two tickets to the baseball game uh, $20, uh, two hot dogs and two Cokes, $15. And we all know that's a lie. It's like $140 to get two hot dogs and a Coke, but whatever. Uh, you know, base, si signed, autographed, baseball, $50. Baseball game with your 11-year-old son, priceless. There are some things that money just can't buy. You remember those commercials? And the reason we love them is because each one, although it told a different story, ended with that same line because we know as human beings, we know that there are moments in life, there are relationships in life, there are treasures to be found in life that are so valuable you can't even put a dollar figure on it. It's those moments where, man, if, if I had known how valuable that one decision would be, that, re, that insider bit of information, that stock, that, that person that I chose to marry, that job that I chose to accept, if I knew how valuable that would be, man, would I have gone back and maybe handled that completely differently, or man, I would have gone for it, or man, I would have run the other direction, or whatever you might say today. But we know intrinsically that there is value in the value of one. One relationship, one decision, uh, one piece of insider information, one experience. And Jesus understood this about us. And so he began to tell a little story that I'd like to begin uh, sharing our time with today by sharing out of Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 45, where Jesus is going to talk about the kingdom of heaven being something of high value. And this is how Jesus explained it. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls, but when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Everything he had and bought it, he sold. What was Jesus trying to say? Jesus was trying to drive home this same point. Men, women, kids, you're going to discover in life, if you have not already discovered, that there are moments, there are relationships, there are decisions, there are things that we can encounter in life that have so much value, you can't even put a price on it. 
And so Jesus tells this story of a merchant, a guy who was in, into economics. He was into selling things. This was his livelihood. He would have run the local pawn shop or the local jewelry store. We don't, we don't know exactly what kind of merchant he was. But when he found this pearl, it was of so much value, he went and he sold everything he had. Think about that. Think about if you're a business owner and you find one product or one bit of insider information and you go and you sell everything. You go all in for the sake of this one thing. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is worth that. It's worth it. And in fact, we are like the merchant that when we come to a place where we discover the depths and the goodness and the love of Jesus and how much he can change us from the inside out, it's worth everything. It is worth all that we have. There, there's not a price tag you can put on that. There's not uh, you know, any sort of relational intimacy. It can't even be described. It's so deep and so far and broad and lovely and beautiful and full of adventure. And so Jesus would invite us into that. And he said, this is the kingdom of heaven. And what's the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven, first of all, is located wherever the king is. And Jesus is with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of heaven has come near to us. And we have the opportunity to step into that, to step into relationship with this God, with this man, Jesus. Do you know Jesus, really? Like, do you know the, the Jesus that is of so much valuable, it's, it's so much value that it's worth everything? It's worth losing some friendships in your life to go after this thing of value. It's worth making decisions that might make you a little bit of an outcast or others might turn their back on you because you're not going with the flow of what all the other kids at school are doing or what the appropriate thing is to do in the business world or what all the moms at the country club are doing or the, the wives at the country club, but you're going after Jesus. Do you know that it's worth more than all of that? Do you know that it's worth everything? Do you know Jesus in that way? Again, this is why as a church, we have our four words, encounter, disciple, serve, and impact. And we start with encounter because we just believe that when people encounter Jesus, everything else begins to fade and Jesus becomes more and more. In fact, sometimes you might hear followers of Jesus use this phrase, I'm ruined. I'm ruined for everything else. Jesus has wrecked my life. And when they say Jesus has wrecked my life, what they're saying is they've discovered that all of the things of this world that we might run after, that we think might give us value, that we think might uh, give us meaning in life, they pale in comparison to this priceless relationship with Jesus. Do you know Jesus in that way? If you don't, I just want you to know, man, there is an invitation from Jesus himself this morning to draw near to him. And he wants to bring you on an adventure that you could have never dreamed even existed. And for those of you that are already on that adventure, there's an invitation to go higher up and further in. Higher up and further in. Those are the words of C.S. Lewis, where he talked about his own relationship with God, how it's a never-ending adventure of going higher up and further in with Jesus. Well, as followers of Jesus, knowing this good news, knowing that the kingdom of heaven and relationship with him is of such value, it's priceless to us. He then gave us the, the, the invitation to go out and be his hands and feet, to be his ambassadors, to be the ones that would go and tell others about the value of this kingdom of heaven. I love this. I love, I love that Jesus could have done it any way he wanted to, right? He could have said, hey, guys, uh, just hang on for a little bit. I'll be back once satellite TV arrives, like 2,000 years from now. I'll be back. We'll start a TV channel, and we'll, you know, I'll get the word out. No, no. He says, no, I'm going to the Father. And where I'm going, you will be also, but, but stay here, he's talking to his disciples, and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And when my spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That was his way of saying, right here in your hometown, right here in your county or in your state, in the nation and in the nations of the earth, followers of Jesus have been given a commission to go out. We are sent ones, those that are, us, are followers of Jesus. And what, we are, what are we sent with? We're sent with the story of our own life transformation and the story of 2,000 years of Jesus encountering men and women and changing lives and wrecking worlds for the better to where the things of this world that we so often run after and try to numb that pain of our internal soul with, whether it's a relationship or whether it's a drug or whether it's a you know, whatever it might be that we run to as human beings, Jesus is saying, hey, I'm the answer that you're looking for. And he gives us the privilege to go and share that. Well, we've been so aware of this invitation to go and share those things. We've actually been in the middle of a sermon series that we're continuing today called Who's Your One? 
Who's your one? The question inferring that we are sent ones and that we're not meant to just kind of live asleep. We're not meant to just kind of go along with life like everybody else is doing and, and say, well, I, you know, I, I got my life change in Jesus. Good luck to you. Hope it works out over there, buddy. Uh, you know, maybe you'll show up at church one day, but I'm just going to do my thing. No, no, actually, we're sent out, again, as I've said, to bring that invitation to others. And so we've been asking ourselves, who's your one? Do you know your one? Do you know the person that God has put you to cross paths with? Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's someone you go to school with. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's some, you know, someone from your family. But God has given us the opportunity to have impact on one another. And so as we learn from one another and as we go out in the community to be his hands and feet, I want to be encouraging you all to ask the question, who's your one? And last week, part of what I, we talked about was that there's a simple message that we've been given to carry. It's called the gospel message. The word gospel means good news. And if you missed last week, I'd encourage you to go back, download our church app, or check it out on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find that message there. It's just called The Bridge, and it would be listed under last week's date. But The Bridge comes from a, a diagram of these four points of the gospel of the good news of Jesus, the four points being that God loves you. He longs to have a relationship with you. That's point number one. Point number two is, but there is a problem. And the problem is there's guilt and shame that builds up on the inside of us, and we call that sin. Sin is anything that breaks relationship between us and God, and all of us have sin, the scripture tells us. We've all fallen short of, of a perfect God. So now we're in trouble because God loves us, but yet we've put a barrier there, and so what do we do? Well, that's the third point, and it's the good news is that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. God himself came because of his love for us. And while we were in the midst of our mess, we didn't have to get things right. We didn't have to clean ourselves up. But in the midst of our mess, Jesus went to the cross and he died for us. And the cross became that bridge to bridge the gap between us and God. And the fourth point of that good news is a question. What will you do with that good news? Will you receive that free gift that Jesus has done for you and for me? Or will you turn your back on that? Will you go the other way? Will you say, oh, well, that's a good bedtime story? Or will you press in and say, no, is, is that true? Could that be true? In fact, you know, Jesus loves it when people ask questions like that. If you're here and you're kind of sitting in the back today and you're like, man, I don't even know if I believe in God. My mom or dad dragged me along or my neighbor brought me today. Again, I just want to say to you, you will never, ever get to the bottom of the depths of the love and adventure of following Jesus. And he loves question askers. He loves those that are maybe a little skeptical and are saying, is this true? Can I, can I really know God in that way? And so last week, we, we talked about that. We talked about these, this bridge, if you will. And then also what we talked about is that as we go out to share this good news, to invite others to know uh, Jesus, that we're not going out like door-to-door -door salesmen. In fact, we're, we're to just go out naturally and share our story. And, and the way that we do that it can look different ways based on different personality types. And we laid out a few of those personality types. One is like the Apostle Peter. He was a preacher. He loved to stand up in front of hundreds and even thousands of people. And he would preach this good news. And it said that his first sermon, 3,000 people got saved. I'm like, man, has, has any pastor ever done that? That's a pretty good deal. I'd, like to, I'd love to stand up for a sermon and see 3,000 people decide they want to follow Jesus. But that was a gift on his life. What I have seen is that more and more, it's for sure in today's culture, fewer and fewer people are deciding to follow Jesus because someone preached in a big room. They still do. That still happens from time to time. We, we still see that from time to time. But uh, maybe 50 years ago or even 100 years ago, there would have been massive crusades and there would have been thousands of people gathered together and somebody with great anointing like a Billy Graham or someone in the line of a Peter would preach a message and so many people would give their faith to God. Today's culture is, has shifted to where it's a little bit different. It looks a little bit more like the Apostle Paul's culture. Apostle Paul, his gifting was not so much preaching to the masses, but he would go into a city, he would sit down in a synagogue, and the synagogue was the local community center. And in that community center, he would engage in conversation and even sometimes debate. And they would reason with one another about different philosophies and ideas. And as Paul stepped into that, he began to unfold the goodness of who Jesus was and how you could know Jesus. And out of those discussions, churches were born. And it says that Paul, with this model, took the gospel to the known world all around the Mediterranean rim. And we're seeing that same model so effective today. 
where people are not so much coming to faith through hearing or through listening, but they're coming to faith more through talking and discovering things about faith. And that's why we run the Alpha course here at Cedar Crest. Alpha is just a, it's a course that's built around this idea of discovering through conversation the, the good things about who God is. Who is he? Why did he die? The Bible. That was written 2,000 plus years ago. Is it really relevant for my life today? Let's have a conversation about that prayer. Can God, does God really hear prayer? I mean, does he care about me, my, my little life? There's so much going on in the world. There's a massive hurricane going through the Caribbean. Does, does he care about me? Can, can he keep all that? Yet yeah, all of that is under his watchful eye, and he does want to interact. Prayer is a conversation between us and God. And in Alpha, we discover some of the ways that we can talk to him and we can even hear his voice. The scriptures tell us that we are his sheep and he is our shepherd and that the sheep hear his voice. And in that model, we see people come time and time again uh, from places of being agnostic or atheist or far from God, but then discovering, oh, there's more to this. This is not just some little made-up story that Grandmama told me uh, years ago. There's actually historic evidence behind this that we can base our faith on. But that's not even the only way. Some of you in this room are gifted in such a way that you're, you're great hosts. And so Matthew was a follower of Jesus. He had lived kind of a rough lifestyle. He was what was called a tax collector. And a tax collector in the time of Jesus would have made his money by taxing the people to give money to Rome. But he always added a little bit more tax so he could put some in his own pocket. Not a guy you'd want to be a friend with, not a man of integrity. He was taking money from his own people. But Jesus came along and said, hey, Matthew, come and follow me. And so Matthew had this encounter with Jesus. And as he began to follow him, he said, well, hey, Jesus, it's great following you, but I've got a lot of friends that don't know you. So what if we had a party at my house? And so Matthew would throw uh, dinner parties at his house and he'd have some of his friends that were far from God over and some of his friends that were close to God over and Jesus would be there often. And at, over those dinner parties, conversations about life and about faith would happen. And so, so much, that's such a model that we've seen people throughout the years since then throw it at their own homes, what they call Matthew parties. They would just, they, we love dinners, we love hosting people at our house, and so we're going to invite some friends over, and some of them are church people, and some of them are not, but we're just going to open up our home and see what God will do. Maybe that's your gifting. Do you know your natural way of being the hands and feet? Do you know the way that God has made you? Have you thought about it long enough to say, okay, if I've had an encounter with Jesus, I, I found this high value thing that I can't even put a price on. Not only that, I've discovered that I am valuable to God, me, individually. And so I'm valuing him. He's valuing me. This is the greatest thing ever. How do I share this with somebody else? Have you thought about your own way? Matthew party? Is it a discussion like the Apostle Paul? Maybe you're called to preach. Some of us in the room are called to be like the woman at the well. And the woman at the well had an encounter with Jesus. And as she had this encounter, Jesus told her a bunch of stuff about her life. There's no way he could have known. And she realized in that moment, oh, my gosh, this is, this is God. And he, only God would know these things about my life. And she was so taken back. She ran into the city. And she said, hey, everybody, you, you got to come meet this man, Jesus. He told me everything there was to know about my life. And so her whole deal was just come and see. Come and see. And this morning, I want to spend our time, the majority of it, reading through a passage and then pulling out a few application points from another place in time where an invitation was given to come and see. And so we're going to be looking in John chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 43. Let me read it to you, and then we'll dive in to see what we can pull out. John chapter 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, and finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Now, Jesus, as we've been talking about, is going around the, the Sea of Galilee. It's a little north of Jerusalem, and he's been going from town to town. He's been healing the sick. He's been casting out demons and cleansing lepers. And uh, as he's encountered people, they've come to know the goodness of who God is through these Jesus encounters. And he's also beginning to call disciples, and one of them is Philip. He said, follow me. Verse 44, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and whom, all, and whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. And then Jesus, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you're still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus said to him, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. 
You'll see greater things than that. And then he added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Man, I love this little story. It's right at the beginning of Jesus kind of getting started with the disciples, and we see right away this model that he expected us to carry this thing on, right? This plan A, this is how God intended it to work. There was no like backup plan. It was, hey, I'm going to call you guys to follow me. So Philip, come and follow me. And then right away, he's allowing Philip to go and to be that mouthpiece, to be that witness, to be the one that would testify to the goodness of who Jesus is and what he's experienced in Jesus. And so Philip just comes out with double, I mean, both barrels blazing. I mean, he's like, whoo, I've encountered Jesus. My life has never been the same. I'm seeing lepers cleansed and all this stuff going on. And so he finally comes over. He sees Nathaniel. He's like, Nathaniel, you're not going to believe it. We found the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. Now, to you and I, that's kind of like, uh, Moses and the prophets. Okay, that's kind of, what is that? But in this day and age, everyone would have known what Philip was talking about because the whole nation was waiting on a man who they referred to as the Messiah, which means the Savior. You see, they're under Roman occupation. And they had prophecies from years before that a Messiah would come and would lead them as a nation and would set them free from their oppressors. And so everybody was looking for the Messiah. And so when Philip comes along to Nathaniel and says, we found the one, Philip is all excited. He's thinking, man, Nathaniel's going to love this. Nathaniel's going to be like, where, where, let me, you know, let me meet him. But what I love about the story, what I love about the scripture is that it's so true to life, is it not? It's not sugar-coated. How did Nathaniel respond? Nazareth. What good can come out of Nazareth? Skeptic, right? Whatever. What are you talking about, you religious zealot? You don't know what you're talking about. Push back. Hey, I've got my own life. Leave me alone. You can hear it in his tone. Nazareth was just this, you know, stinky fishing village uh, that would have been, you know, up near the Sea of Galilee. And uh, no one was expecting the, the Messiah to come from there. Philip didn't go into with him all the prophecies about the Messiah that had been fulfilled, that the Messiah would actually be born in Bethlehem as Jesus was. And then after being born there, his family moved to Nazareth. He didn't even bother kind of going into all that. And I don't know if Philip didn't know some of those things yet, if he was just so new to his faith that he didn't know what else to say. But I love his response to the skeptic Nathaniel. He just, he doesn't try to argue. He just says, well, come and see come and see. I I don't know how to explain it all to you. I just know that my life has been changed. It's a little bit like the blind man who who was born blind and encountered Jesus. And when when he was questioned about it afterwards, what what happened to you? Who healed you? He's like, I don't know. I I don't know what, what happened. All I know is I was blind and now I can see. I was broken and now my life is put back together. Have you had that kind of interaction with Jesus where you can say, all I know is my marriage was in trouble. All I know is my kids were off the rail. All I know is my physical health was failing, and then Jesus entered the picture. Have you had an encounter with Jesus? Does your story have that intersection where you were going along in life, and then something of such value fell into your life that you've been wrecked for Jesus ever since, that you'll never be the same? Well, that's what happened to Philip. Philip had had an encounter with Jesus. He's like, I I don't know what to tell you. All I know is you need to encounter Jesus, so what? Why don't you just come and see? And then I love Jesus' response as as Nathaniel walks up. I love what he says. He says, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. There was no shame. There was no, hey, Nathaniel, get your act together, man. Who who are you to question me? Have you not seen what I have done? Have you not seen the power that that I have to heal and to change lives? No, none of that. It's an invitation for Nathaniel to draw close. Hey, man, come on up. Here's a man in whom there is no deceit. You know that Jesus, as I was saying earlier, welcomes the question of the skeptic. He welcomes the question of the seeker. And so if that's that's you here today, if you would say, man, I'm, I'm probably Nathaniel, I want you to know that Jesus is inviting you to draw close. And the scriptures don't tell us about the interaction, but what we do know is basically a verse later, after an interaction, after an encounter with Jesus, Nathaniel declares about Jesus, Rabbi, you are the son of God. Teacher, you are the son of God. That encounter with Jesus changed everything. And then I love how Jesus thing goes on. He says, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You're going to see greater things than that. And then he says, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Now, what in the world does that mean? 
Again, Jesus is speaking a language that would have been culturally relevant. They would have understood what he was talking about because he was telling a story of one of their ancestors. And one of their ancestors by the name of Jacob, who had had a dream that had become a famous dream where he was sleeping on the ground in the promised land. And as he was there, heaven opened and a ladder came from heaven or a stairway came from heaven and angels were ascending, uh, and ascending and descending on this ladder. And so they knew that this place would be holy forever. And so when Jesus said, you're going to see greater things than this. In fact, you're going to see heaven open and a ladder uh, that will come and angels descending and ascending on me. On the Son of Man, Jesus was proclaiming, I am the answer. I am the fulfillment of that prophecy. Where I am, the kingdom of God is. And when you are with me, you are with God. And for 2,000 years since that time, men and women that have encountered this Jesus have encountered heaven. And so I ask you again, have you encountered this Jesus? Have you encountered the one that brings with him the kingdom of heaven? And when the kingdom of heaven comes to bear on your life, you're ruined for everything else. Nothing else will ever satisfy when you've tasted of Jesus. Do you know this Jesus? Well, I know that in my own life, as I have experienced more and more of Jesus, the adventure has only gotten greater and greater. But there's some things I've learned along the way and some things I want to pull out of this text with our remaining time together that we need to be very, very aware of. Number one, it's important that we commit to being an intentional witness. Guys, it's so easy as we begin to follow Jesus. It's like a gravitational pull of just getting sucked into the comfortable center of the Christian bubble. Before you know it, all your friends are Christian, all your kids' friends are Christian, everybody around you follows Jesus, and it's just, woo, you know, we love Jesus, we love, you, we love uh, Jesus, yes, we do, we love Jesus, how about you? And we just kind of forget, we forget that we've been given an invitation to actually go outside of our Christian bubble and to invite others to experience that same life-changing love that we've experienced. And so one of the first things we have to see in this text is that Jesus called Philip, but then what did Philip do? Philip didn't just say, well, let me just sit at your feet all the time. He said, well, let me go find one. And so then Philip went and found Nathaniel. Philip had in his mind, who's my one? Who's my one? I was one for Jesus, but now I'm sent out to find my one. And Philip found Nathaniel. Are you being intentional? It says it. Verse 45, Philip found Nathaniel. And that leaves us a question. Will we, will we be intentional? As followers of Jesus, will we follow the model that's been given for us? We've been found by Jesus. Will we find another? What's your story? I mean, if I was to, man, I would love to sit down with every single one of you and just ask you, if you know Jesus, how did you meet Jesus? I guarantee you that nine out of 10 of you are going to say it was a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister or a coworker or a friend, but there was one other person in your life that reached out to you, that, that prayed for you, and that brought the love of God somehow to bear into your life. And when you discovered the message that they were carrying, it changed you forever. And ever since that point, you've never been the same, and you've been on this journey with Jesus, and you could point back to one person. And you were their one. You were somebody's one at some point in time if you're a follower of Jesus. And so my question for you is, have you paid that forward? Have you realized that you were at once somebody's one, and now, just like Philip, we're invited to go find Nathaniel? Who's your one? Are you being intentional about that? That's the first thing. Number two, the thing that we see, as we see again in verse 45, um, Philip goes into an explanation to Nathaniel. He says, we found the one that Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So what do we see there? Eventually, he gets to just come and see, but come and see begins with go and tell. You can't give the invitation to come and see unless you're willing to step out and risk sharing a bit of your story and your own encounter with Jesus. And if you've had an authentic encounter with Jesus, then you know you've got something to share. So are you willing to step out and go and tell, realizing that an invitation to come and see only comes after we are willing to be bold and to go and tell? And so my question for us on that point is, are we willing to be accountable to go and tell? Are we willing to be accountable to go and tell. This is not about works. This is not about some have to. This is not about earning the favor of God. This is about reminding ourselves, oh yeah, I know something really awesome that changed my whole world. Why would I not want to share that with somebody today? Duh. I need some help being accountable though. Because I get lazy, I get tired, I get busy. And so in my own life group, we have just times of accountability where we say, okay, 
Like, for instance, last, uh, this past Wednesday, we talked about what we discussed last Sunday with the four points of the gospel, and there was eight scripture verses. There were two scriptures for each point of the gospel. And so our point of accountability this last week as a life group is I looked at my group and I said, okay, how about this? How about we commit to memorize those eight scripture verses so that we know it, so that it's the, on the inside of us. We looked at some scripture that said we should be prepared in season and out of season to share the hope that's on the inside of us, that we carry this relationship with Jesus. And so being prepared is memorizing some scripture. And so everybody kind of looked at each other and they're like, oh, are we, are we going to have like a pop quiz next week? And I was like, sure, why not? Let's actually be accountable. Let's actually memorize some scripture. And so I loved my group because they were like, great, sounds good. Let's figure out how to do it. But if you're like at all like myself and the members of my group, we need a little bit of accountability because life just happens. And it's so easy to come and listen and sitting in a row on Sunday and say, yeah, that was, that was a good thought. But the mi- you know this. The minute you walk out of here, you're going to forget 90% of what I said. And by tomorrow, you'll be hard-pressed to remember anything. And you'll thank the Lord when it shows up on social media. And you go, oh, yeah, that's what it was about. But we forget unless we are willing to submit ourselves to accountability with others. And so when it comes to Going and telling. Are you willing to hold yourself accountable? Maybe even asking someone else, hey, would you ask me if I'm being a faithful witness? I remember um, my pastor in Texas, he talked about traveling internationally and he was in a season where he felt like God had told him, hey, I want you to share the gospel, which just means loving on somebody uh, at least one time every day. This is what God spoke to him. This is not what you have to take on. This was his deal. And he felt from the Lord that was the invitation that, that he was to accept. But he was traveling and he said, man, I was so tired. I've been on multiple overseas flights. And I was like, God, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't know what to, I don't know what to do here. And so finally he just said, you know what? I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pull out some, some gospel tracts. He had some New Testaments in his Bible. And he said, he said, literally my accountability was I went into the bathroom and I washed my hands and I left the New Testament sitting by the sink at the airport. And I walked out and I said, Lord, I did my bit today, okay? But I held myself accountable. I, he had some other guys that were holding him accountable and asking him, hey, have you been a faithful witness? It doesn't have to look extravagant. It doesn't have to be a massive dinner party or preaching to thousands, but are you being obedient to go and tell? Third thing that we see in this scripture is that we do the inviting, but Jesus does the convincing. We do the inviting, but Jesus does the convincing. I love that when Philip found Nathaniel, he tried to do a little convincing. Like he, had a, he had a little bit of story, a little bit of background. He was trying to build a bridge, but Nathaniel was like, what? What good can come out of Nazareth? What are you talking about? And so he said, hey, man, just come and see. Just, you got questions, just come and see. And this is how it's meant to work, guys. We are never intended to go out and take our Bibles with us and find somebody on the street and Power of God, Bible over the head, street preacher, thump, you know, repent and be saved. And then, you know, all of a sudden somebody's life is going to be changed. I have never met a skeptic, an an agnostic or an atheist that said, you know, I didn't believe in God. But once I was walking down the street and this Christian began screaming at me that I was going to burn in eternal hell. And I thought, maybe I should follow Jesus. I've never met that person. I don't know about you. I've never met them. It's not up to us to convince somebody of the truth of these scripture, but we are sent with an invitation and with our story. We have our story and we have an invitation and we just simply say, hey, here's what I've encountered. I was broken. I was in the midst of pain. I encountered Jesus. My life has never been the same. Come and see. Come and see. And then when we give the invitation to come and see, the rest is up to God because God's the one that's pulling hearts. God's the one that's working on the inside so that those that are far from God might have an opportunity to come and know him. So my question for us is, will we be full of faith? Will we be full of faith that it's not about you and it's not about me, but it's all about God? And we give the invitation and he does the rest. I hope that you'll take those three points from this scripture and live it out. I wanna close by giving you eight quick things. I'm gonna make it super quick um, that we need to be aware of on this journey. As we are seeking to be intentional witnesses for Jesus, as we're understanding that uh, to give the invitation to come and see, we have to go out and actually engage in some conversations. But then also as we're trusting Jesus in this, there's going to be some things we might fall into, some ways that we might end up in a ditch. And and I want to use the word repent. There may be one of these or maybe multiples of this list of eight that you might need to repent of. And repent means I'm walking this way and I turn 180 degrees and I walk the other way. I walk away from that way of doing life. And so if you need to repent, if you need to ask forgiveness, maybe jot these things down. If one resonates with you, I want to encourage you to do business with God. The first thing is, do you need to repent of an insider mindset? Do you need to repent of an insider 
mindset. An insider mindset is what I was talking about early. I got my Christian friends. I got my Christian circle. We're good. Stay away from me, dirty world. Stay away from me. You guys are doing stuff you shouldn't do. I don't like that. You need to get a long, long way from me because I'm nice and clean and want to keep it clean. Insider mindset. Do you know that Jesus hated that kind of lifestyle? The Pharisees were all about that. All about outside of my cup is clean. Don't get near me. Walk by on the other side of the street when somebody's over here who needs help. Jesus said, no, no, no. Followers of Jesus run into the mess. They run into the place of pain. Guys, as followers of Jesus, it should be an ongoing evaluation of your life of, do I have relationships in my life of people that are far from God? Whether it's a neighbor, whether it's a coworker, am I pressing into those relationships? Am I living like Matthew lived? The guy who did the Matthew parties, do I have, if I were to invite friends over to my house, do I even know anybody who's far from God? As a follower of Jesus, you've been called to live your life in such a way that you could extend an invitation to those that are far from God. And it's messy. You have to live in attention because the super religious people over here will be like, ooh, why are you friends with people like that? And then you're standing in the middle and you're actually trying to follow God. So then the people that are over here in the world that are far from God are like, mm, why, you know, why do you, you're like holier than thou. Why you got to be a goody two shoes? And so you find yourself in the middle and it's messy. And people on both sides sometimes don't like you and they won't understand. But you're called to actually stand there as a follower of Jesus. Jesus and to say, I'm going to pursue holiness and I'm going to surround myself with others that are going the same way, but I'm never going to go so deep into that pursuit of, uh, of Jesus that I'm not able to reach out a hand to bring somebody else along. So do you need to repent of an insider mindset? Are you living for others? In fact, we base our entire Sunday mornings around not being just insider focused. It'd be so easy for a Sunday morning to be all about insiders and for me to use nothing but theological words that only people that have been following Jesus for 40 years would even understand. But we intentionally try to build our Sundays in such a way that we engage those that are far from God, are seeking, and we equip those who are walking with God. It's engagement and it's equipping. Are you insider focused or are you willing to stand in the gap? I need to go faster. That's number one. <laughs> number two, do you need to repent of a coexist mindset? Coexist mindset. What do I mean by that? This is there's a bumper sticker that says coexist. Yeah, and you may have seen it. If you have it on your car, I'm so sorry. I may be about to embarrass you. But when I see that sticker on the car, I go, oh, Lord, I just I want a citizen's arrest. I'm going to pull them over for DUD, driving under deception. I mean, this is just, let's have a conversation. Can we please? And here's why. I understand the heart of that. I, I, at least I believe I'm wanting to believe the best in those that have that sticker on their car. Their heart is, hey, can't we just get along with one another? Can't we love one another? And the answer as a follower of Jesus is always yes. Yes, we love everybody always. Yes, everybody always, as Bob Goff says. So if you're a follower of Jesus, can we coexist in that way? Can we love no matter what your skin color is, no matter what your sexual orientation is, no matter what your religious background is? Can we love? Absolutely, and we should be Everybody always loving them, yes and amen. Can we say yes and amen to that as followers of Jesus? Great, okay. But the reason the coexist mindset grates me a little bit is because on that sticker, you've got all of these different symbols and paths and then the cross at the end. And it's a, it's a way of saying, hey, there's many bridges to cross the same river. If you found your truth, good for you. That's awesome. And I just want you to know, guys, it's not good for others. There's not many bridges to cross the same river. And let me, I, I want to be loving here because it's not my words. It's Jesus' words, actually. Jesus is the one that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Don't get mad at Van. Don't get mad at Cedar Crest. That's Jesus. And so the cross is always separate from other ways because it means so much more. It's God who died because he loved you and longed to pull you into relationship. And so it's not a bunch of bridges crossing the same river. There is only one way. There is a black and white truth to be known. Do we love everybody? Always. Yes. Do we look down our nose at others that think differently than we do? No, we don't. We humbly say, Hey, can I share with you about what Jesus did to me? Can I share with you the truth of what an encounter with Jesus will do for your life? Are you aware of that? Or are you just kind of allowing culture to blow you along that says, well, as long as I'm being nice to people, it's, it's okay. As long as they're being nice to people, it's okay. No, ultimately, it's, it's not going to be okay. 
unless we know Jesus. And that leads me to number three, which is a disbelief in hell. Do you need to repent of a disbelief in hell? I'm not going to say much about this because I'm actually preaching on hell next week. In fact, my sermon title next week is What the Actual Hell? That's what we're going to talk about <laughs> because it's an actual place. It's a physical location. And I, know, I know we're laughing, but it's a, it's a serious thing. And it's not going to be a hellfire and brimstone talk, but it is going to be about hell. We'll, we'll, we'll get the fire and brimstone out of it. I've never preached a sermon on hell. This would be a first for me. But guys, when we live with a, with a realization that there is eternal separation from God, this, hell is not, you know, it's not the cartoon where the people that like to party and smoke weed hang out. That's not hell. Hell is for those that do not have a relationship with Jesus and therefore will spend eternity separated from God, a God who loves them. It's a real place with real consequences. And when we live with that understanding about our family members and about our neighbors and about those that we go to school with who may be far from God and don't realize the path that they're on, there should be a burden on the inside of you that says, I got to share the good news of Jesus. I got to let somebody know what Jesus did for me. I can't convince them. That's up to the Holy Spirit. I can't beat them overhead with the Bible to get them to understand, but I can give the love of God away and I can say, do you know Jesus? Do you need to repent of a disbelief in hell? Number four, what about busyness? This past week, I walked into a subway and I had ordered my sandwiches online with the app and I was ready to pick them up and go. And I found myself having to wait for like three minutes. I mean, it wasn't long, but I'm, I'm like, man, I got things to do. I order in advance on the app so that I can come in, I can pick it up, and I can go. And here, this poor high school girl behind the counter, she, I'm sorry, you know, trying to make it and, you know, trying to get the sandwich right. Am I so busy that I'm just going to stand there and roll my eyes and be like, oh, my gosh, this subway? Or am I going to say, hey, you know what? This is divine opportunity. Hey, it's all right. How you doing today? Anyway, I can pray for you. There's, there's opportunity at every turn in our life if we'll just turn away from being so busy all the time. Oh, I want to keep going. All right, number five, <laughs> fear of rejection. Number five, fear of rejection. Have you been rejected by a friend? Uh, you know, this is, oh my gosh. Uh, when we begin to follow Jesus, people that don't understand what that means, when, when they think, Jesus, that's like 2,000 years ago, a dead guy. They don't get the fact that, no, he's alive. He rose from the dead, 500 people, 11 different occasions, eyewitnesses to the account. He changed my life. They don't get all that yet. And so many times, coworkers, friends, neighbors will just turn their back on you and reject you. Are you living out of a fear of being rejected? Are you living out of the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done in your life? <clears throat> Number six, Loss of heart and witnessing. Maybe you have shared your faith with somebody. And again, it's up to God where that person is. And maybe they hardened their heart to your message. And it didn't really seem to make any difference. And so you just, you lost heart. You said, well, I tried, tried that before. I shared my story and didn't work out. So why should I ever do that again? Guys, it's all up to Jesus how people respond. We've been sent in season and out of season to be prepared to share the hope that we have on the inside of us. Lack of accountability, number seven. I've already mentioned that. Are you walking in accountability with someone? Are you walking in a rhythm where you say, this is so much value to me, and I realize I'm so prone to getting focused on myself or busy in life that I won't slow down long enough to have a conversation with somebody about Jesus? Do you have accountability? Are you in a life group? Are you inviting other men and women to hold you accountable to share your faith? Number eight, the, just the failure to invite. A failure to invite. Guys, you've been given the greatest message to ever be preached are you one that's walking with that message and inviting others to come and see? In the same way that Philip with Nathaniel and said, come and see. That is our, that's our uh, commission, to live out the great commission, to be inviting others to come and see. I can sum it up like this. When he's your one, you'll go and find one because found ones find one for the sake of the one who is over everyone. When he's your one, you're going to find one because found ones will find one for the sake of the one who is over everyone. Now, that's not just a cute phrase that rhymes. That is some seriously awesome theology. Because if you get it, if you understand that I have been found and I found a treasure in Jesus and Jesus loved me enough to pick me out and he found me and I found something of value that is worth everything in my life that like the merchant at the beginning of what we began talking about today realized it's worth everything, it's worth selling everything I have to go after this one. If I've encountered that, then who am I to hold on to it? 
Who am I to keep that for myself or to keep that in my family? I've got to find a way to let others know about what they can experience in Jesus. And so my question again for you today is who is your one? Who is your Nathaniel? Who is the one that God has put in your path that you would go after? Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Are you living your life in such a way that it would appear maybe you're ashamed of the gospel? Or do you understand that you can live unashamed of the gospel, understanding it is the power of God to bring salvation, which means saving grace to those in your life that you're in community with, to your loved ones. Guys, this is not some like have to and beat me over the back and make me, this ought to be bubbling up out of you. Man, Jesus, you're so amazing. You're so awesome. You've radically changed my life. What can I do but try to give this away to other people in the natural way that you've created me and with my personality type and with my family and all of that? How does that look in my life? How does that look in your life? There's a pastor who lived on the East Coast and went to Hawaii. He was in Honolulu um, spending a week there and he was teaching and doing some preaching and he found himself dealing with some jet lag and you know Hawaii is many hours behind the East Coast and somewhere around three o'clock in the morning, he woke up and he was ready for breakfast. I mean, it was like, that's eight or nine o'clock on the East Coast. I don't know the exact hour difference, but he was hungry. So he went to a local diner there in Honolulu, walks in about 3.30 in the morning. And it's kind of, you know, people that are coming out of bars and getting ready to go home to go to sleep for the night, but he's already awake and starting his day and wanting some breakfast. And about that time, a group of ladies come in and uh, he hears their conversation and eventually kind of discovers overhearing their conversation in the next booth that these ladies were prostitutes and they had been out working the street and um, dealing with clients and all that kind of stuff and they were sharing some of those stories and in the midst of the conversation one of the girls kind of let her guard down a little bit and said hey you know next week's my birthday and the other girls just culture of what that was oh nobody celebrates birthday when they get our age I mean who cares about that and he said he noticed the girl's walls went immediately back up oh yeah you're right you're right now I mean no one you know we're not going to celebrate not going to do anything but in his mind he thought you know I'm actually going to be here next week um, I think I'm going to come back so he did he got with the owner of that little cafe and he said hey I want to have a birthday cake here next week he had no idea if the girl would be there or not but that next week he showed up about three o'clock in the morning and sure enough these same girls that must have been working in area in town there came into the, the diner and he walked over to the table with a birthday cake and he said, hey, I just, I just want you to know I was sitting in the booth last week. I heard you over talking. I heard you say it was your birthday. And I serve a God that loves people. In fact, he loves you very individually so much so that he uh, has a plan for your life, a purpose for your life. And I felt like Jesus wanted me to tell you happy birthday. He loves you and your life has value. Well, there's some tears in her eyes and the diner began to celebrate and happy birthday. They broke out into the song and they sang and they had a great time of fellowship and loving on this girl who uh, really didn't know if she was worthy or not to be celebrated. And after it was kind of kind of died down and over, the owner of the diner came back over to the, the guy who had bought the cake and he's like, man, you know, so what do you do? He's like, I'm a pastor. You're a pastor. What kind of pastor hangs out in the middle of the night with, with prostitutes in a cafe? And he said, well, the type of pastor that passes a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning, that's the type of pastor I am. Guys, my question for you this morning is, are you the type of followers of Jesus that would throw a birthday party for a prostitute at 3.30 in the morning at a local cafe? What does that look like in your life? How does that translate into your life? What does it look like for you to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to not pull back into the holy huddle and have the insider mindset, but to understand there's something of eternal significance here at play. There's a decision point that's gonna mean either eternity with God or eternity separated from God. And we, the followers of Jesus, have been given the task to carry our story and to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to say, there's a God that loves you. There's a God that sees you. And I'm not here to beat you over the head with the Bible, but I'm here to let you know about this God that loves you and let God do the rest. Are you living your life in that kind of way? When he's your one, you'll go and find one because found ones find one for the sake of the one who is over everyone. Who's your one? Would you stand with me?
I wanna ask our prayer team to come to the front. Every Sunday, when we finish, we sing a final song to drive home the point of what we're all about. And today we're gonna sing a song that's called Reckless Love. And the reason it's called Reckless Love is because we have a God who loves us with such, such extravagance and loves us to the point where he leaves us even freedom to reject his love. And so when we sing about reckless love, the reason we call it reckless is because he knows himself that there are some that will reject that love. But I want you to know today that you are loved. And if you're open to receiving the love of God, I'm gonna have some friends down here at the front. In fact, if I could get a couple more life group pastors just to come on down and be here at the veil, but the front. If you're in need of God, in need of an encounter with God, maybe you're already a Christian, you're not yet a Christian, it doesn't matter. You've got something going on in your life, something's in your marriage going on, you've got a physical issue going on in your body, something in your finances, you need God to show up in your life. Uh, we're gonna be here available to pray. Again, I need some life group leaders to please come right now. Even while I'm talking, please just step out and come on, thank you. They're gonna be down here to pray. And I just wanna say, please don't leave today without asking someone to pray for you. There's no point in coming in and just kind of listening, but we come for an encounter. And as you come to the front and as you seek prayer, encounters with God happen. We've seen lives change. And so as this song is sung, if you have any need of all of an encounter with God, we'd love to have our friends here at the front pray for you. Let me pray and then we'll sing as we finish together. God, we love you. We're so grateful that you saw value in us enough to give your own life so that we could know you and we have found such great value in knowing you, God, that it, you're worth everything to us. It changes everything. Encounter with you changes everything. And so I wanna pray this morning for someone who may be saying, man, I, I wanna know that kind of life-changing encounter. I thank you that you draw near to the person that's calling out for that. To the person who's saying, I need God to show up in this area of my life where there's challenge, where I, I need the, the power of God to be real in the same way that when Jesus stepped into this, these towns and there was healings that happened and there was lives that were changed. You, you may be here today and you say, I need that. God, I'm asking for you to move as people call on your name. And Lord, lastly, as we sing this song, Reckless Love, it is, it is a proclamation that we understand the extravagant love that you poured out for us on the cross, that you would leave the 99 to come after the one. We understand the value of one and we worship you for it. In Jesus' name we pray.